All right, so this is part four of the video series with Giselle, and we're going to be talking about the hack. We'll get right into it. Okay, so in this video, we're going to be talking about the hack um, with Giselle. And there's a couple different types of hack that you can do in falconry with bird of prey. There is sort of a long-term hack every day, every night for a long period of time, which is a, like a full hack experience that a lot of people do with falcons, where they use a hack tower and uh, they're coming and feeding them at the tower every day, but otherwise they're out all day and all night. What I'm gonna be talking about is what's referred to more as a tame hack, where the bird will be out during the day and then brought in at night. And we'll talk about some of those reasons why. And I have some experience with this, past experience, before I did this with Giselle. I did this with Cooper's Hawks, and I did it with a sharp shinned hawk actually, but the sharp shinned hawk, I, I did the hack in my house. So I basically let him fly free in my house when he was growing up, which was really interesting. But I saw positive benefits from that. And with the Cooper's Hawks, I did see also a lot of positive benefits from the hack, um, which gives them an opportunity to, you know, really learn how to fly, spend time outside from sun up to sun down, uh, learn to use the wind, build some flight muscle, learn the skill of landing, and, and just overall chasing things, learning how to take care of their tail feathers and their uh, primary feathers, their wing feathers better. I just saw a lot of benefits from it from hacking a bird when I when I did this in the past with Cooper's Hawks and so I decided to do it with Giselle also. One of the other things I found was it just kind of put their head on a little bit better. They were just a little more mentally sound. It's almost like that experience of almost a month out in the wild during the day was really helpful. It also exposes them to a lot of things and, and because they're learning how to fly, if it's something they're afraid of, they have an opportunity to move away from it um, which allows them to get over the fear and they can see things from a distance and they don't feel tied down or held down. So it just really helps with um, that sort of behavior. So I saw a lot of benefits in the hack with Cooper's Hawks and I, and I wanted to make sure I did that with Giselle, my first goshawk. Um, there are some drawbacks to hacking a bird. It can be risky. You know, if your bird stays out at night, there's owls and other nighttime predators that you have to worry about. <clears throat> Giselle ended up staying out one night during her, her hack time, which was concerning, but it ended up being okay. Um, you have to worry about electrocution. If you're near electrical lines or wires, you have to worry about, you know, cats and other daytime predators, even other hawks potentially. If you're in a neighborhood, you have to worry about neighbor's dogs. Um, so, th so there are some things you have to consider before going through with a hack, but the benefits that I saw in, in doing a hack with my birds were, were worth it. They outweighed the potential drawbacks and the negatives. And um, I just really like that method for raising a bird for falconry. With Giselle, I hacked Giselle on the farm that I live and work on, and it's a 214 acre farm. I did let my neighbors know, we're surrounded on all sides by neighbors, I let them know that this was gonna be happening and that if for any reason Giselle happened to come over during the hack, that they saw her, that she was a nuisance or anything at all to let me know. That way, you know, they didn't accidentally scoop up my bird thinking it was a young bird that needed help. And she didn't travel very far from uh, the initial hack site, you know, in my backyard. I think the furthest distance she ever went was about 400 yards away during her time out at hack, which isn't, you know, incredibly far away. So it wasn't like I ever had to track her down during that time. But you do have to be aware of your surroundings. Uh, but it was a great experience for her. She had um, a lot of things to look at on the farm, tractors and horses and cows and dogs and, you know, excavators and ATVs. And so she got a lot of uh, exposure to a lot of different stimulus and stimuli. And so it, it actually made it easier later on when I was hunting with her in situations where those things popped up. She didn't really react too strongly to them. So uh, again, um, hack is really helpful for exposure. Uh, I was lucky to be able to do it on a farm and, and on such a big farm. I actually ended up 
terminating the hack, stopping the hack because she killed one of our chickens. She she uh, attacked a chicken once, and then for another week she was fine, and then a week later she she killed the chicken, and so that was the end of the hack for her because we couldn't have her killing chickens on the farm. But it was a great experience, and she got a lot out of it uh, for sure. And I started her hack at 45 days old. Um, this was at a time when she she could fly about 10 to 15 feet, and, and I had been spending a lot of time with her after work in the backyard with her free, so I knew what her mobility level was. So I knew that she could ladder up and down out of trees, and she was mobile enough to move around a bit. And so I started her hack at 45 days old. So I'm gonna talk about the daily routine that I used uh, with Giselle during the hack. So first thing in the morning, I took her out of her crate or her giant hood, which is what I have her sleep in overnight. And I would put on her transmitter on her leg first. That was the very first thing I did, very important. I didn't want to use bells because I didn't want to attract anything. And the transmitter worked well enough for me uh, that it was easy to, to keep track of her during the day if I needed to. So uh, take her out of the crate, put her leg transmitter on, and then uh, weigh her, just so I know where we're at. And then I would put her outside, and during the time she was outside, I would take a couple minutes to prep her food. I would call her down to her leather lure, let her eat as much as she wanted. Once she came off the lure and lost interest in it, then I would pick up the lure and go to work. Uh, when I got home after work, I would call her down to the leather lure, but this time only for a tidbit. I would pick her up, take her inside, get her weighed, put her in her crate, get her food ready for the afternoon training session, put the crate, the crate in the truck, drive out to the training field, and I would set up my remote controlled car. I have a remote controlled car with a rabbit lure tied to the back of it with a string or a piece of rope. I would set up the remote controlled car in the bushes or in the tall grass, take Giselle out of the crate, um, make the car go, you know, pulling the lure, dragging the lure. She would catch the lure. I would trade her off the, the rabbit lure to the leather lure and then to the magic carpet, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And then I would repeat that process maybe one or two more times. And then on the last training session, she I would let her eat as much as she wanted. She would go back in the crate, back in the truck. We would drive back home. I would then put her on her mang perch M-E-N-G, in the living room on the floor, and she would hang out until bedtime, and at bedtime I put her back in her crate for the night. So I'm gonna walk through all those, all those steps, but that was, that was the basic rundown. So um, in the last video, I talked about how I liked to have my birds sleep in a crate overnight when they're young. It just helps them later on when you're traveling, and that preps them for traveling, traveling in a crate or a giant hood during future potential trips. The transmitter that I used was a pretty cheap old transmitter where the antenna was ripped out, but I knew she wasn't gonna go very far away. And so that's a great hacking transmitter. They also sell hacking specific, or transmitters specific to hacking. Um, and I usually use Marshall Telemetry. It's just really reliable and, and a big company and um, good customer service and all that. And you can find everything that I'm talking about on mikesfalconry.com. Um, all the supplies and falconry equipment I use, I usually get from Mike's. So um, put the leg transmitter on and make sure that that's working and there's a good strong battery in it. And then I would weigh her on the scale so I could um, just keep track of her weight. At this time, I wasn't actually controlling the amount of food or her food intake. I was feeding her all she wanted twice a day. Once in the morning, around 6.30 in the morning. Once in the afternoon, uh, just before sunset when I brought her inside. So there was about a 12 to 14 hour uh, window in between feedings. So I would put her outside after weighing her give her 10 to 15 minutes to settle down, and then I would bring out the leather lure with uh, tiring attached to it or her meal, you know, a whole opened quail. Um, call her down to it, let her eat as much as she, wa she wanted, and I would wait until she was completely full, lost interest in the lure, and walked away from it. I also made sure the lure was weighted so she couldn't carry it off anywhere, and I stood 
right there or sat right there next to the lure while she was eating so she could get used to my presence when she's on the lure. Once she lost interest and she moved off the lure, then I would pick up the lure and, and go inside and then head off to work. I did come and check on her once or twice a day in the beginning just because I was paranoid, um, but she ended up being totally fine. And I, I kind of stopped doing that towards the end of the hack. And in total, she spent uh, just over three weeks out at hack. Um, and again, I, I mentioned it earlier, I had to end the hack because she started attacking the chickens and we couldn't have that. So when I would get home in the afternoon, I would call her down to the leather lure for just one tidbit of food. So I'd tie a little tidbit on there and call her down because I didn't want her to get full. And, and what this was doing was it was really imprinting the leather lure as a recall device. And then I would uh, pick her up off the lure and take her inside and weigh her again and put her in her crate. So she still has the transmitter on and um, I'm getting her food ready for the afternoon meal or the evening's training session. Again, I didn't control the weight initially. Um, put her in the crate and drive her out to the field. Uh, I was basically simulating a hunt in doing this during the hack so she could get used to all those different parts of traveling and getting to the field. And eventually they learn the routine and they get into the anticipation of knowing that when they go in the crate and they go in the truck and they're pulled out of the crate that they're gonna be chasing something. So um, when it comes to the RC car, the remote controlled car, uh, you can, I put a link down in the comment section below so you can uh, see which RC car I purchased. You want a pretty strong, powerful RC car so it's fast enough and sh strong enough to pull the lure and fast enough to make your hawk kind of work for it. And in the beginning, she was really bad at chasing the lure. She was uncoordinated and um, you know she was just a young bird but she very quickly became confident. And uh, when, when she would catch the lure, I would drag the lure a little bit more to simulate her actually catching a rabbit. I was planning on hunting cottontail and jackrabbits. And so I got a large rabbit lure that was the size of a jackrabbit. And then it wouldn't just die as soon as she touched it. It would struggle, quote unquote, a little bit after she caught it. And I did that to prepare her for eventually catching a jackrabbit or a live rabbit because they don't just turn off once they're grabbed. Um, so I would get to the training field and I would set up the remote control car in some bushes or some tall grass. And initially during the initial stages of this, of this training, as soon as I took her out of the crate, I started dragging the lure with the remote. That way she didn't have time to think about really what was going on. It was just come out of the crate and immediately chase something. Um, later on, I took longer and longer to do that. And so I would take her out of the crate and I would wait 20 seconds and then 30 seconds and then one minute and then two or three minutes. And while I was waiting to, to drag the lure, I would go walk through the bushes, walk through the grasses, kicking bushes and shaking things like I would be doing in a normal rabbit hunt. So I was really simulating what she was gonna run into later. And I also did all this training in fields that had rabbits. So I was doing this initial training in my future hunting fields. So that way she could get used to the fields, she could get used to the environment. And eventually what I would do is I would elongate that process to where it would be 10 minutes before I would drag the lure. And, and eventually I'd get a live rabbit to jump up and she had something real to chase. And so it was a very easy transition into hunting, which I'll talk about in the next video. But in these initial stages of training, I would um, hide the RC car, walk around for a bit and start stimulating a hunt and then uh, drag the lure with the RC car. Once she grabbed the rabbit, I would go over and trade her off the rabbit to the leather lure and then to the magic carpet. The, the magic carpet is basically a piece of carpet or astroturf with a string attached to it where you tie on a tiring, you know, a rabbit leg, um, a small amount of food, where they can feel comfortable eating it, but they're not eating off the kill. And the reason why I did that was I was trying to avoid possessiveness. And the idea is that if they, you know, in the future, they'll catch a rabbit and you'll trade them off to the magic carpet and then you can put the rabbit away in your bag and then you can continue hunting. And by doing multiples, by catching multiple, uh, you know, rabbits or prey in one hunting session, that they, that they lose possessiveness, that they won't mantle and, 
and um, be really possessive of the kill. And so I did that where I was transferring from the rabbit lure to the leather lure to the magic carpet and then we would do another training session. And so we would do two or three of these training sessions. And uh, it worked really well. I do think I would, I would do it differently in the future though and I don't think I'd have the leather lure in between the rabbit lure and the magic carpet. I think I would have just done the, the rabbit lure and then offered the magic carpet. Uh, there is already enough training to the leather lure where you don't need to reinforce that anymore because she's feeding on it and she's getting a full feeding on it in the morning. And then you're calling her down with it in the afternoon. So I think I would skip that extra step in the future. Uh, but that's what I did initially. And then when I saw that she was slowing down, then I would, um, I would finish the session. So if I could only get two training sessions in where she flew to the rabbit lure, and then transferred to the leather lure and the magic carpet, then I would just feed her up completely on the magic carpet and then pick her up, put her in the crate and take her back home. I didn't wanna risk her getting full and losing interest and in flying off or not chasing the rabbit because uh, then I, I wouldn't get the training in that I wanted. So uh, once you got home, I put her on a Meng perch, M-E-N-G, Meng. And it's a perch design that I, that I really like, and I, I bought it from a company called Mirthwood, which I'll, I'll put a link down below to that also. The idea of the main perch is that the ring, the metal ring, doesn't move around the perch. It's, it stays in one place, and the perch is a little bit tall, and you tie the, the leash for the bird a little bit short so that the angle created by the leash keeps the bird from being able to get good grip with their feet on the ground and bait really hard. So the idea is that it avoids leg damage and scale damage if you get the, the leash length right. And you need to use the leash extender with this system because the way that this perch is set up, their tail um, will be in the way of the leash. And so the leash or the leash extender portion of the leash will run up through their tail. But because of that effect, it makes it uncomfortable for them to be off the perch on the ground. And it keeps them from baiting a lot and I and so I just really like mang perches and I uh, I bought two a smaller one and a larger one and they're transportable and I use them everywhere I go and I don't use any other kind of perch with her um, when I'm traveling so I would get home um, put her on her mang perch on the living room floor and then and, and tie her to it and leave her there for the rest of the evening with the TV on and you know cooking dinner and things happening so she was always exposed to it um, and then, you know, at bedtime, I would pick her up and put her back in the crate for the night. So that was the full process that I used. And one other thing to keep in mind is when I, when I was training and simulating hunts with the remote controlled car, with the rabbit lure dragged behind it, um, I, I was also trying to think about all the things that she would run into in a normal hunt. So I started wearing hats and sunglasses, different kinds of hats, different shirts, different jackets and clothes and shoes and shorts and pants and uh, and I got a game vest so she could get used to that. You can get that on mikesfalconry.com. Um, I tried to think of all the different things. I even wore binoculars. Um, I tried to think of all the different things that I might have when I was out hunting with her in the future so she could get used to all those things now when she was still young and still going through the experience. And I also made sure to switch training fields pretty frequently so she wasn't used to just one field. So she was used to showing up at a pretty new place and still doing the same routine of chasing the lure. And I think all those things, thinking through all those things is important so you can avoid any issues you know, in the future later on. I did mention that she spent one night out during the hack. And at the, towards the end of the hack, I did have to start reducing her her morning meal just a little bit so she had enough hunger where she'd come down in the afternoon uh, but again I tried to feed her as much as she wanted in the morning as much as she wanted in the afternoon but I did have to start kind of messing with those numbers and bringing her food intake down just a little bit in the mornings later on to maintain that responsiveness you just want to be really careful about not adjusting the weight very quickly up or down in any direction because you affect behavior and so a slow weight change is, is really important. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to the actual hunting portion of the video uh, in the next video. 
Something else you may want to do and, and that I did when I was out training um, with Giselle initially during the, you know, the RC lure dragging was I would try to invite people with me as often as I possibly could. I would try to get people over to the house and people out in the field with me as much as possible. And I would have those people bring cameras and wear things. And I did that again to expose her, you know, for the future so that I could hunt with other people in the field with her in the future. And she's turned out to be really amazing um, hunting in the field. She doesn't have issues with other people. And it, it's also a good idea to film yourself, I think, to find a good quality camera. And I linked to one down in the comments. And to film yourself handling your bird and film your training process because it allows you to look at it and see mistakes you might be making and sort of reevaluate your technique. And that, that helped me a lot because sometimes in the moment, you don't realize you're doing something or that the bird is giving you signals and body language that you should be picking up on. So I found that to be very helpful. So in Giselle's case, the, the hack lasted uh, just over three weeks. It was about three and a half weeks, and then I pulled her in. And it was definitely worth it. It's much easier during that three weeks of time when they're learning how to fly and they have dandruff, feather dander going everywhere. And, to just leave them out the whole day. It's a much easier way to manage them, uh, I think. And so I really found that hacking outweighs any potential downsides to not doing it. And I would, I would recommend it for those of you who have the ability to do so. Um, it's a really good method of getting your bird socialized, exposed, flying well, and just well adapted to their future falconry life. So that's the video on hacking. And again, in the next video, we're gonna talk about the beginning stages of hunting and, and Giselle hunting through the years. Thanks again for watching and uh, look forward to the next one.